All right. Now we are talking about Catherine Ann Porter and the story. It's actually a short story of hers that we read this week. The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. Yeah, Weatherall. Good name. There's a photo, of course, um, of Catherine Ann Porter in the written out lecture. Fun to see that, too. Um, she also, like, um, I talked about Susan Glasswell having a bob, shorter hair. So does Catherine Ann Porter. Um, so more of that, you know, early 20th century sensibility, you know, whereas Amy Lowell was maybe rooted a little bit uh, more in the 18 into the 1900s. Okay, so, uh, and and her dress is like definitely more of a modern dress. You'd recognize that. Or it's a shirt, maybe can't quite tell. Um, in the lecture, there are, of course, plenty of links if you'd like to learn more about Catherine Ann Porter or her works. Um, there's the Catherine Ann Porter Society link. Um, there is a YouTube link that is a 1980 dramatization of the short story of hers that we read, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. So that might be fun to watch, you know, short story uh, adaptation, you know, that has been filmed. So again, it's always fun, I think, to watch something come to life and see how people, like, um, you know, in, uh, take what's in print and, and transform it into um, visual imagery. Of course, you know, visual imagery is created through through words too in our minds um but it's, it's a different genre obviously film um but it's kind of fun to see see what they do in that um i would of course read the story first and then watch it because you don't want to predispose yourself to that story experience when you're reading it always read the work first and then and then watch it afterwards so that you can make all those connections and visual imagery in your mind first and then see what somebody else came up with you know it's kind of fun to compare that way and contrast. Uh, and then there's a neat link that compiles um, some of Catherine Ann Porter's advice for writing. Yeah, you ever want to get advice from a Pulitzer Prize winning author? There you go. Uh, what a treasure. Also, um, a YouTube video of the program Day at Night gives us. It's a real interview with 83 year old Catherine Ann Porter herself. This is the first for our class in that we have finally reached the time when our women authors were living long enough actually to be filmed, right? We can both see and hear them talking on film. Enjoy Catherine Ann Porter describing her harrowing experience with the 1918 flu pandemic. Remember, I mentioned that when I was talking about the times, you know, the early 20th century times. It's a pandemic that infected one third of the world's population. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I think I said in the video where we talked about the times, I think I said it killed a third of the people that had it, but no, no, no. I misspoke. It infected a third of the world's population and killed about 10% of those it infected. So that's a lot of people. A lot of death there. We can certainly relate to a worldwide pandemic, but like this, these, these kinds of numbers are horrific, you know, infecting a third of the people and killing 10% of those that it infected. Um, so you can watch that YouTube video. And then there's a link to a program about Catherine Ann Porter from the PBS American Master Series. And then a video... Um, with an instructor discussing meaning and jilting of Granny Weatherall, including the story's use of the stream of consciousness, literary technique, and epiphany. Um, I, we had talked about that in the uh, uh, overview of the early 20th century literature time period. All right, so Catherine Ann Porter, she's an American. She was born Callie Russell Porter, and she lived from 1890 till 1980. Yeah really long time she lived till 90 years old about right she was born in indian creek texas where she lived with her father mother and siblings till she was two years old when her mother died at that point she and her family moved in with her paternal grandmother who was named Catherine ann porter Catherine with a c with whom they lived till her grandmother died when callie was 11. wow she's gone through a lot of loss her mother then her Moves to, lives it with her grandmother and then her grandmother dies. The grandmother was a stern, strong-willed old woman, but she was an accomplished storyteller whose ability Catherine seems to have valued so much that when Callie divorced when Callie divorced her first abusive husband, I mean her her abusive first husband, not her first abusive husband. Those are two different things, right? Her first husband, her first husband was abusive and she divorced him. 
And then she had the courts legally rename her after her grandmother, Catherine Ann Porter, except Catherine Ann Porter, the author, Callie, you know, formerly Callie Russell Porter, she spelled her name with a K, whereas the grandmother spelled it with a C. So that differentiated them. Interestingly, inspired by real life and memory, Porter's fiction often centers on characters seemingly to embody grandmothers, as in the story we read this week, The Jilting of Granny Wetherall, which she published in 1930. So that's kind of, you know, interesting. She obviously the grandmother made a big impact on her. Um, And younger female characters often parallel Catherine. In other words, the younger Catherine Ann Porter, the Callie Russell Porter, the writer um, herself, as in her Miranda character. Um, She attributes her distinct characterizations or fictional thumbprints to their basis in real life people. So they, these people became very vivid in her stories because she based them on real life people and so could draw from a fully fleshed out human being, right? And then try to recreate that in the characters. In fact, Catherine herself stated, quote, constant exercise of memory seems to be the chief occupation of my mind. And all my experience seems to be simply memory with continuity marginal notes, constant revision, and comparison of one thing with another, unquote. When, quote, thousands of memories converge, harmonize, arrange themselves around a central theme or a central idea in a coherent form, unquote, she continues, quote, I write a story, unquote. And that's quoted in our anthology. That's where I got that quote. So you can read it in there. This importance of an interplay with memory seem coincident with the early 20th century stream of consciousness literary tool, which is certainly evident to great effect in Catherine M. Porter's short story that we read this week, The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. Inspired by other consciousness streamists like James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, Porter's stream of consciousness also culminates in the epiphanic moment or epiphany when characters make a leap of insight in the face of stimulating circumstance. So that's what the epiphany is. It's like this sudden boom, light bulb goes off in their head, you know, and they have this moment of clarity or this moment of great insight, you know, that can change their lives or at least their ways of thinking on something. Um, The stream of consciousness literary technique presents the thoughts of characters one after another as kind of like a window into the character's mind. And that's very much like the quote she talked about earlier. I mean, the quote she made that I quoted earlier, um, which she says, you know, her constant exercise of memory seems to be the chief occupation of her mind. And uh, all my experience seems to be simply memory with continuity, marginal notes, constant revision and comparison of one thing with another. And then when thousands of those memories converge, harmonize and arrange themselves around a central theme or central idea in a coherent form. I write a story and it's kind of like what we have in the jilting of granny weatherall right if you, when you read that you'll see it's very much that stream of conscious thought that is running through granny weatherall's mind you know and it's converged around this theme and you'll see what that theme is obviously it states the jilting of granny weatherall so somehow it involves jilting right um so that will help you make sense of what you're reading a little bit more when you read The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, just knowing that it's this stream of consciousness of the thoughts that are playing through um, Catherine Ann, or not Catherine Ann Port, but Granny Weatherall's mind. Uh, and it's and it's very realistic. You know, if you analyze how your own mind operates, you'll see, like, do you necessarily go in a linear form or do you jump from like one association to another, right? Like you might think of, I don't know what you're going to do for the day. And then all of a sudden it might remind you of something you did yesterday. And maybe that reminds me of something you did 10 years ago. And maybe then that jettisons you forward in the future. And you think about, oh, oh, I went on that trip 10 years ago. Am I going to go on a trip in the future? I should go on a trip in the future. You know, and so it's like very associational instead of linear. Like it doesn't go chronologically, our thought process. It jumps around from association to association. And so that's the idea behind stream of consciousness writing is to present that stream of conscious thought that that um, goes upon association and association in the mind the human mind um and in literature it culminates in a in an epiphany and that may happen in reality too right when you think a lot about something and you have lots of associations and you 
bring together many experiences and all of a sudden, boom, the light bulb goes off, right? And you have a brilliant idea suddenly. So think of that as an epiphany. All right. Well, um, the stream of consciousness literary technique, as I said, it presents the thoughts of characters one after another. They're knit together often by theme or association. In other words, one thought leads to another, to another, to another, often by association between something and one idea or memory, which provokes the thought of another based on some type of association with the former and so on and so forth. Porter uses this technique to portray characters vividly, realistically, and intimately. The jilting of Granny Weatherall, we in the jilting of Granny Weatherall, we follow the associative stream of thoughts coursing through Granny Weatherall's mind. Often th thoughts run forward and backwards in time as our minds are compendia of all that happens to us. One thought can retrieve a memory from long ago, while that long ago thought can stimulate a memory from, for instance, yesterday even. Thoughts of the mind seem to exist outside the space-time continuum as they race freely from one place to place to another place and thought to thought and even time to time in our lives. We journey with Granny in this short story as her mind races through memory and time and place until the mind's dream culminates in its final epiphany or final moment of clarity and realization for Granny Weatherall and for the reader too, because we go on that journey with her and we culminate in an insight too, as the short story ends. On another note, Catherine Ann Porter seems to have led quite a diverse life. She tried her hand at acting and singing. She worked as an extra in film. She performed in little theater productions as an actress. She worked as a newspaper journalist, writing film critiques and gossip reports in several cities across the United States, including Chicago, Denver, Fort Worth, and New York City. She was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1915 and contracted the deadly flu of the infamous pandemic of 1918. She had to recover in a sanatorium, which she left thin, weak, and bald. Her hair grew back, but was white for the rest of her life. She captured this experience in her novella, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, in 1939. Starting at the age of only 16, Catherine married four different times and divorced each husband. She seemed to have had several miscarriage, miscarriages, perhaps even an abortion and a hysterectomy, uh, I mean a hysterectomy because of an alleged gonorrheal infection from one of her husbands. She traveled to Mexico several times because she found its, quote, chance of salvation, unquote, refreshing and inspiring. Its inversion, quote, the dissolution of that chance, unquote, she traced in, quote, expatriated Americans, unquote. She even joined circles with Diego Rivera, the famous artist, when Mexican folk art entranced her. He's the Mexican folk artist. Um, these inspirations may be found in Porter's Maria Concepcion, the Mexican Trinity, and her short story collection, Flowering Judas. In addition to Mexico, Catherine lived in Paris during the 1930s, when so much of the literary world also resided and exchanged ideas there. Catherine converted to the Catholicism of her first husband when she married him. She later abandoned those principles during the mid of her life, but seemed to return to them in her twilight years. Catholicism also surfaces as the religion of Granny Weatherall, in that character's many reflections. Uh, there's a priest who comes in at one point. You'll see them. Catherine wrote numerous short stories, her primary mode of fiction. However, she did write one novel, Ship of Fools, in 1962. She worked as a professor at several different colleges with much success as a creative, unconventional, and popular lecturer. In 1977, when she was 87 years old, she published The Never Ending Wrong, a protest about the Sacco and Vanzetti case, uh, which she, along with numerous Illuminati, had also protested in the 1920s because of the case's blatant anti-immigrant prejudice against Sacco and Vanzetti, who were accused of a crime that they thought they did not commit. 
Catherine won the 1966 Pulitzer Prize in Literature for one of her many short story collections. Uh, so enjoy reading more about Catherine Ann Porter, her life and times, and the short story of hers that we read this week. It's quite intriguing. The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. <laughs> 